بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وسيد المسلمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم افتح لنا فتحا مبينا وارزقنا رزقا مباركا كريما اللهم بارك لنا وارحمنا برحمة تغنينا بها عن رحمة من سواك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Welcome, dear brothers and sisters, um, on this very blessed night. Um, SubhanAllah, I hope, inshallah, and pray that all of you are aware that uh, tonight is the the moment that commences the uh, event of the birth of Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the anniversary of it, starting, you know, after Maghrib time through tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, the majority of the scholars have agreed that it's probably on this 12th day of Rabi'a al-Awwal. And before I, I say something about this, uh, I say subhanAllah that this night in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is born is a night in which we are summoned by Allah azza wa jal, guided by Allah azza wa jal to talk about the abode in which we will get to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jannah, right? So no accidents in the planning of Allah azza wa jal. Alhamdulillah that Allah has gathered us to remember Allah, to remember Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to reflect upon the words of Allah and His Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in talking about the ultimate destination, Jannah. And inshallah, as you're aware, we're going to spend this, um, uh, the next three sessions talking about Jannah to conclude our series on the hereafter, a journey that started, as you're aware, right after Ramadan in the month of June, and here we are uh, several months later, nearing the conclusion of this journey, whatever knowledge that Allah has blessed us with, it's a gift of Allah. With that, I remind myself and everybody else of the greatest deed we can do tonight through tomorrow, bi'idnillah, which is to send salawat upon Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Especially at this time when we hear so much uh, noise, that noise that, that that certain people, some people on this earth, uh, raise um, in 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 vilifying Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in trying to tarnish his image, and none of this, none of this noise matters. Quite honestly, Allah states it in the Quran. Rasulullah is the beloved of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and when we hear this noise, we're really summoned to cherish Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more, to renew our allegiance to him, to to reflect upon him more. And to try to learn about him, but the ultimate deed that you and I are not even capable of doing, we summon Allah to help us do it, is to send salawat on Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So I want us throughout even this session to keep that in the in the back of our minds. So keep saying, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. We'll be remiss if we forgot that to remember Allah and to remember his beloved Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For Allah says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yasalluna ala nabi. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. It is Allah himself, the exalted, the almighty. He and his angels deliver salah upon Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is stated as a verse in Surah Al-Ahzab. Then he commands you and me, if we are believers, he commands us, O oh, you who believe, invoke these blessings of Allah upon Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is not something we can perform on Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is Allah Himself who does it. But we're summoned to do it in a manner in which we invoke Allah Himself to send the prayers upon Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we cannot do it. We can't. All that we can do is ask Allah Himself to perform that greatest of acts, which is to send His Salah upon Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning to send His mercy, His special blessings, the boundless blessings. And because we're not capable of, of it, we ask Allah and beseech Him, Ya Allah, send your blessings upon your beloved Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because whatever blessings He sends is going to benefit you and me. It's going to manifest in light in your heart and my heart. Ibn al-Jawzi, the famous scholar, said that those who perform salawat on Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the most or plentifully and abundantly, they're going to get these benefits. The heart of that person who sends a lot of blessings upon Rasulullah Muhammad is going to be enlightened 
whatever darkness in your in your light in your heart will be washed away and it will be replaced by a light from Allah Azza wa Jal. Ghafara dhanba. All of his sins, all of her sins will be washed away, forgiven by Allah Azza wa Jal. Can you imagine all that weight of all the de- of the misdeeds, shortcomings and mistakes and sins washed away? Sharah Allah sadra wa yassara lahu amrah. And Allah Azza wa Jal will expand his chest or her chest. You know when your chest is constricted, Allah will expand it. That means distress, stress, fear, grief, Allah will wash it away. Allah will facilitate his affairs or her affairs. You're, you're facing difficulty. These words of Ibn al Jawzi are derived from the hadith of Rasulullah Muhammad because he used to encourage the companions to keep sending salawat upon Rasulullah Muhammad. So before we begin this journey, inshallah, with Jannah. Let us send few salawat on Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam together. And inshallah, after we conclude, we'll do the same so that we're not amongst those who forgot to send salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on this greatest of nights in the year. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. 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 Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad 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 I said it 10 times because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said whoever says 10 salawat on me in the morning and in the evening is guaranteed to be with me and to receive my intercession So alhamdulillah may Allah grant you that gift And and, and I also brothers and sisters um Inshallah, uh, you know, I, I had a thought that I, that escaped me. Inshallah, it will come back. But but keep this thought, Inshallah, of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with you throughout the night. Um, inshallah, with that, we'll begin uh, these um, last episodes, Inshallah, in our series. Bear with me, Inshallah, until I share the screen. Okay, can you hear me clearly? Thumbs up, inshallah. Okay, uh, if, I, if there's any issue, please let me know. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Here we are, we arrived at the last station in the description of the journey of uh, the hereafter. We conclude with the ultimate uh, station, the ultimate destination, the abode of the righteous, this place that Allah has promised the believers, this place that Allah has built with His own hands. This is a summary again, the diagram that describes the journey. We started at the at the at the experience of death several months ago, and we went through all these stations into the life of the grave, uh, Al Barzakh, into the, the 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 moment that summons the day of judgment, the blow of the trumpet, and all the grand events, the earth shattering, the the sky or heaven shattering events of the day of judgment and the end of creation into the moment in which all of us are resurrected from our graves, all the bones, the brittle bones, and all the decomposed bodies come back to life. And the souls emerge into these bodies to stand before Allah in what is called the gathering, in the land of gathering. And we talked about the grand intercession of Rasulullah Muhammad wasallam. So the mission of Rasulullah is not over and is going to stand up on that day. And even those who try to vilify Rasulullah and hate on him and the are going to be begging to be with him. And they're going to be beseeching Rasulullah to intercede, for he is the only one who will intercede. We spoke about the arrival of Allah and the arrival of the throne of Allah and how it's placed on the land of gathering. We spoke about the testimonies of the nations, the testimonies of the prophets of Allah, when Allah asked them questions as to whether or not they delivered uh, uh, and fulfilled their mission to call people to Allah. We spoke about the accounting of Allah and how Allah will place all of our deeds that, that are that are recorded to the minutest detail in our records and how these records will be emptied into this grand scale. Al Mizan that weighs if it if if it if it wa if 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 Allah were to do that, if it could weigh the heavens and the earth, as Rasulullah told us and into that wonderful, extraordinary moment of meeting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa at his pulpit by the pond 
in which the river of Kawthar pours, a moment in which we will be given a drink from the from the honorable hands of Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we spoke about the Sirat, the bridge over the hellfire that is thinner than a than than a than a sword <clears throat> or sharper than a sword and thinner than a than a string, right? That takes people to, to Jannah. And we spoke last time about the hellfire, and here we are finally arriving at Jannah. Jannah, this abode that Allah has has established and and built with his own hands as a place of bliss for the believers. Definitions, Jannah, what is translated as paradise or the garden is again the eternal abode of the righteous. Allah made us to exist in Jannah. And we know the story that is described in the Quran so that we don't forget. And imagine life if you didn't know where you came from and where you're headed, right? It, It has no meaning whatsoever. None. It, it will be pointless. It will be empty. It will have no purpose. And Allah asks us in the Quran, Did, do you think you were created without purpose? Well, we came from somewhere and we're going somewhere. Allah tells us in the Quran, Adam alayhi salam was created and placed in Jannah. Then he was taken out of Jannah after he and Hawa ate from the tree. And they were placed on this earth. And Allah intentionally placed them in Jannah so that they know where they came from, so that they know this was their home, so that when they're placed on this earth, they don't forget, so that they can miss Jannah. So it's a journey back to Jannah because that's the home of our father and it's all of our homes. Those of us who forgot that and settled on this earth are going to miss out on on the opportunity of living the greatest dream, preparing for the greatest destination. The home that you and I are intended to live in, we cannot find joy ever, eternal, absolute joy, without being in that realm. All of our wishes and dreams cannot be fulfilled on this earth. This is not meant to be our home. We're meant to travel through this land, through this realm, on a journey back to our home, Jannah. So notice I said journey back because we came from there. The Quran generally uses the term Jannah to refer to paradise. However, for those I'm sure you've heard of that term. You ask for Firdaus all the time. We recognize it's the greatest place, right? Indeed, Firdaus designates the highest level of Jannah, the highest layer of Jannah. And Jannah in the Arabic language means the garden. Jinan, Jannah and Jinan, garden and gardens. And Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ no one knows the joys that were concealed and hidden for them. So the joys of Jannah, which we're going to describe over the next three sessions, inshallah, are hidden from those who are outside of Jannah. Outside of Jannah. The word, interestingly enough, Jannah in the Arabic language, comes from, a, from the root of a, of a word that means that which is hidden. So notice the word, for example, jinn. Jinn is the other type of creation that Allah has created that we cannot see. So they're hidden, thus the word jinn. So jannah, jannah, right? The two the two letters, jann means hidden. So jinn are hidden. The garden, jannah, is hidden. And also there's another interesting word in the Arabic language, an adjective, we say majnoon. Majnoon is a reference to somebody who lost their mind. As if to say their intellects have been veiled and hidden. And because they are no longer able to use their intellects, their intellects have been hidden and shielded, so they're called majnoon, also deriving from the same word, because the bliss of Allah is going to be hidden and kept for only the dwellers of Jannah. And it's also to further the excitement and the anticipation for Jannah. As if Allah is saying, you want to know Jannah? It's not going to be just shown to you. It's very special. It's like a special jewel that is preserved in its own box. And because of the density, the intense density of the trees of Jannah, nobody can see inside. You know, even from earth, that when you pass by these big mansions that are surrounded by these trees, these lush, uh, dense trees, you cannot see inside, right? They intentionally keep the garden or the backyard and the front yard hidden from the eyes of those outside because they don't want to mess with their own privacy, right? They don't want the envious eye, the intruding eye. Can you imagine now the realm that Allah has prepared, how hidden it will be with the density of the trees surrounding it? So it's it's the abode that Allah has prepared for perfect, perfect, pay attention, perfect and eternal joy and pleasure. It has nothing that could diminish or spoil 
that pleasure ever. Not even a single moment that you'll have in Jannah in which you can ever experience grief or fear and anxiety or even be bored, as we'll describe inshallah in, 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 you know, uh, later on. Nothing is ever lacking in Jannah. Purity is never ever disturbed. No joy is ever taken away. The pleasures of Jannah are also not symbolic. Many people have attempted, Muslims, including some scholars, have attempted to portray the pleasures of Jannah as being merely symbolic, right? And Allah is very clear in the Quran. It's not merely symbolic. The pleasures and the joys of Jannah are both through the body and the soul. So it is actually physical, except that the physical experience of Jannah and the next world is not like the physical experience of this world. This world is, is confined by time and space. The, the realm or the abode of the next world is an eternal realm that sits in a different dimension. So our eyes, our hearts, our ears, our sense of smell, our sense of touch is going to experience the world differently. There's going to be different laws that govern that experience. There's going to be different colors, different sounds, right? We're going to be equipped to be able to see things we couldn't even see on, on earth or here on earth. So it's a different realm. And that reality begins when we leave this world. So the realm of the grave is different. You cannot apply the laws of this world to the laws of the realm of the grave, right? It's a, it's a realm that lies beyond our comprehension. Similarly, similarly is Jannah. But bear in mind, keep this point in mind that the pleasures of Jannah are real, they're spiritual, they're also physical. These are the names of Jannah that Allah has uh, referred to in the Quran. All these names that are listed here refer to different aspects of the beauty of Jannah. So whenever you reflect on one of these names in the Quran, in the different surahs, they're going to convey a different aspect or dimension of the pleasure of Jannah. Or they might actually refer to a different Jannah within Jannah. So let us go quickly through them. Al-Jannah is the most commonly used term in the Quran and the hadith of Rasulullah Muhammad وسلم, to refer to Jannah. Firdaus. Firdaus, as we said, is the highest garden of paradise, of Jannah. Darul Maqama. Maqam in, 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 the, in the Arabic language means the place where, in which you settle. So Allah says Darul Maqama, the home of settlement. Meaning that you're going to go there, you're not going to be taken out of Jannah. Ever, ever. Nobody can come and say your, your visa has expired. Sorry, you didn't pay your taxes. We're going to have to confiscate your home. None. Once Allah puts you in Jannah, no one is taking you out. That's a decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah says you're coming to settle. But settle for how long? Eternally. There is no leaving Jannah. So that name refers to that aspect of Jannah. Darus Salam. He says it's the home, the abode of peace. But it's not your peace and my peace. It's the total peace of Allah. Can you imagine when Allah Himself, who is a Salam, guarantees for you and me that what you're going to experience in Jannah, every single moment, eternally, is peace. Isn't peace the thing that eludes us the most in this life? You might have everything. I might have everything in terms of physical needs and so on and so forth, but our hearts might be distressed. We all search for that peace. Everything assaults that sensation of peace in our lives. We go through trials and tribulations that really shake our core, and we lose that peace. We experience fear, grief, distress, etc. Allah says none of that will be ever experienced in Jannah. It is therefore the home of peace. And if the name of Jannah is the home of peace, guess what? It is guaranteed in it. Otherwise, it wouldn't have that title given to it by Allah. It's also called the Darul Akhirah, the home in the hereafter. It's also called Jannah wa Adn. Jannah wa Adn. Jannah wa Adn is a reference first to everlasting bliss, but it's also a reference to a special high home, high garden in Jannah. Jannah al Khuld is a reference to the eternal nature or reality of Jannah, the eternal gardens. Khuld means lasting, enduring, never ever expiring. Again, a, a, an aspect of Jannah, you're not going to experience death ever in Jannah. There's no such thing as getting old in Jannah. You're there and there eternally. Jannah al-Ma'wa is also a reference to the idea of settling or, or being placed in a place of security, ma'wa, a place, a refuge. So it's the garden of refuge. Jannatun Na'im. Na'im in Arabic means bliss, delight. So it's a place of perfect 
a multidimensional infinite bliss, infinite na'im, infinite delight and happiness and joy. Maq'adu um, sidq Allah also references something in Jannah called maq'adu sidq إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي جَنَّاتٍ وَنَهَرٍ فِي مَقْعَدِ صدق. That the pious, the righteous, are in rivers and 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 gardens في مَقْعَدِ صدق, Sitting or, or, or settling in what is called the assembly of truth or the station of truth. And that's a reference also a place in Jannah. الْمَقَامُ الْأَمِينَ Amin means the trustworthy one or the, the place of safety and security. So it's the house in which you'll never ever experience any fear. It's total peace and security and safety in Jannah. Again, these are all things that we yearn for, but we can never ever experience in this realm. Allah guaranteed that Jannah has them. Imagine these names, brothers and sisters, just think and reflect upon these names. They themselves convey to you what Jannah is. Allah describes attaining Jannah, getting into Jannah as the ultimate triumph. Again, if you were to think of all the achievements that we aspire for in this in this world, what would they be? What's the greatest thing? What is the greatest wish you have for your child? Right? We wish for them to graduate from school, you know, from a university, attain high titles. We wish for ourselves to have bigger homes, you know, retire in a nice way, in a nice place, and so on and so forth, and be able to have all kinds of vacations and be with family, and, 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 the greatest achievement. Maybe somebody aspires for something else. They want to become a president. They want to, um, you know, build a big company. They want to do this. They want to do that. They want to do da'wah, right? All kinds of ambitions that we have. Allah says, the one greatest, one, there's not multiple, the greatest achievement, it's called the triumph. It, it's called falah. Allah says, this is it. There is no second or third. And if you don't get this one, we failed. Completely, it is getting into Jannah. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, verse 185, Listen to the words of Allah where He says, Whoever is saved from the hellfire and admitted to the garden will have indeed triumphed. That's it. That's it. There is no other definition. So the question is, whose definition do we adopt? Can you imagine... For those who don't even believe in Allah, believe in the hereafter, what they're defined by Allah to be, they're the ultimate sinners. Because they don't even have a conception or a perception of something beyond this life. So all their ambitions and dreams are confined to this world. And notice the dreams and the ambitions of this world are short-lived. They have to go away. So no matter what somebody, what glory somebody might have achieved, look at all the predecessors. All the great kings and queens and achievers and military uh, conquerors and, and artists, and engineers and scientists, where are they? They're in the grave, right? And their glories went with them. Sure, we can read about them, but they're done. They're short-lived, right? And one day all of life will end, so they cannot. these achievements cannot transcend time on this earth. Allah says, is this what you aspire for? Are we so, so stingy on ourselves that all we can aspire for all we can imagine is this world, and what is the extent of our dreams in this world? You notice they're still limited. Allah says, I'm going to take you higher and higher. You might lose everything in this world, but if you get Jannah, you've achieved the ultimate triumph. Again, that's the definition of Allah Azza wa Jal. What is Jannah like? So if you, if you ask somebody, it's like, what is Jannah like? I ask you, what is Jannah like? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi summed it up. Because you cannot imagine it. It surpasses your imagination, and Jannah defines description. So the best that Rasulullah said to us to really capture what Jannah is, is this beautiful hadith. This is actually a hadith Qudsi. Allah said it, and Rasulullah conveyed those words to us. And these are not the words, words from the Quran. They're called hadith Qudsi. Words of Allah or meanings from Allah articulated through the tongue of Rasulullah Muhammad وسلم, where Allah says, أَعْدَدْتُ لِعِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحِينَ مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ this is one of the most beloved hadith to me. Allah says, I, Allah Himself, built Jannah, prepared it. He said, I prepared for my righteous slaves, the ones that He loves. What did you prepare, Ya Allah? He says, that which no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and that which never crossed the imagination of a human being. Can you imagine that? So all the things that you've seen, what's the greatest thing I ask you that you've seen? 
Have you been to an exotic island before? Stood on the top of a mountain. I remember I, w- I was at a place where we ascended a mountain and it was above the clouds. It was the most mesmerizing scene of my life. It was really b- bitter cold though. It was hard to stand there. But I couldn't imagine because you fly with planes over uh, the clouds. But I, could, I, I couldn't imagine that one day I'll be standing above the clouds, right? And I'm looking down on them, right? Unbelievable scene. I've seen tree, a tree, only then that I understood the trees of Jannah. It's called the Bamiyan tree. Those, anybody from India will understand uh, what the Bamiyan tree is. It's the most extraordinary tree on earth, in my opinion, right? This tree has multiple trunks, not one trunk. There's a main trunk and then it goes into other trunks. And then the canopy of the tree stretches out. I've seen it with my own eyes. Wallahi. It stretched out for, you know, I think two blocks. I was like, what? How can this canopy keep going? Only then, me and my wife looked at each other. We said, that's what Allah talks about. Because I never understood how Allah says in Jannah, you're going to be walking under a tree for 100 years. I said, how does that work? My imagination is limited. Allah, when I saw the banyan tree, I said, subhanAllah, now I understand. Here it is. Even on earth, Allah's showing us a mini, minuscule example of the trees of Jannah. But the trees of Jannah are much bigger and much more beautiful and stretch out for not two blocks, for years. So the question again, this is what I've seen. What have you seen? All this, Allah says, what you're going to see in Jannah, it, you've never seen. You cannot even, you know, you cannot possibly see it here. There is nothing like it. Right? The colors of Jannah, the noise of Jannah, the objects that you'll see in Jannah, the creatures you'll see in Jannah, the feelings you'll see in Jannah, you've never seen before. What about ears? You know, what's the greatest sound you've heard? You know, um, subhanAllah, we always share with each other beautiful recitations, right? Beautiful poetry. You love beautiful sounds. We love the murmurs of water, the beautiful uh, uh, adorned sounds of creatures. Especially when they recite the words of Allah Azza wa Jal, it melts your heart. Can you imagine all these beautiful voices? Don't even compare to the types of sounds and voices you're going to hear in Jannah. You have no idea. Like you have not heard beauty yet. You have not heard beautiful sounds. When you hear the voices of Jannah, you're going to realize you've never heard them before. And Allah is going to equip your ears to hear new sounds, new types of melodies that you've never heard before. Imagine hearing the recitation of the angels of the Book of Allah, of Dawood alayhi salam, who was granted the most beautiful voice. The, the Prophet Dawood alayhi salam was granted um, musical, melodious voice that made the mountains melt. The mountains started to melt and dance with him. Can you imagine? You're going to get to hear that. So Allah says, I have prepared for you things you've never heard of before. And the sounds themselves you've never heard. The experiences in Jannah, you've never experienced before. So it doesn't matter what descriptions you come across. These are mere descriptions. They don't capture the reality that you're going to experience in the next world. So keep dreaming. Your dreams about Jannah will always come short. Because it's beyond your thoughts, imagination, and comprehension. These are the words of Allah. And Allah says, now go dream. Go dream. Can you imagine missing that? Can you imagine missing that ultimate gift? Can you imagine seeing it that day and realizing, oh my God, I didn't prepare for this, I didn't work for this, etc. What else does Allah say? I shared this verse earlier. Rasulullah recited this hadith. This Qudsi hadith, he himself quoted a verse from the Quran in which Allah says, No one, no soul knows what is kept hidden for these righteous servants of Allah, no soul knows what is hidden from them of joys as a reward for what they used to do. Nobody can ever comprehend it, including jinn, angels, etc. How beautiful is Jannah or how worthy of or great of a realm it is? There's, here's another hadith from Rasulullah in which he says, So I, I put a picture, a couple of pictures for you. And let me say the second uh, hadith. He says, the space of a bow of any of you in paradise is better than this, what the sun um, rises upon. So you see two pictures here. The top picture is a picture of a, of a, of a whip, right? So Rasulullah is telling us, put that whip on the floor. How much space does it occupy? What is it? Three, four feet maximum. 
He says, a space this big in Jannah, that's it. Just three, four feet, just around you. That's all you have. Is better than everything in this world. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Somebody asks you, would you rather get all this earth with all the exotic beauties of this earth, you own it completely, or a space in Jannah in which you cannot even move? Which one would you pick? Most likely we're going to pick earth. I said, no, let me give, give me earth. And Rasulullah says, you lost. A little space around you in Jannah is much greater, much bigger. When you see it, you'll understand. And he said in another hadith, the space of a bow, and the second picture at the bottom is a bow, right? The bow arrow, you stretch out the bow a little bit. How much space is that? Three feet again? Rasulullah is trying to emphasize the idea. He's like, don't miss out. Even this space is better than all that Allah has created, everything that the sun had set rays upon. Again, to try to capture us what Jannah is. It cannot be compared to anything in this world. The, pleasure, the pleasures of this world compared to Jannah are fleeting. Enough for us to know this. If there's one fact that we need to know about Jannah that should compel us to seek it out, to say it's not worth it to miss Jannah, to lose Jannah, it's, it's the fact that Jannah is eternal. So suppose you have everything in this world. You've attained, again, all the pleasures. And you have the strength to enjoy all these pleasures. You never got sick. You have children. You have your spouse. You have homes. You have this. You can travel anywhere. You don't have to work. Everything. One day you're going to have to die. I'm going to have to die. We're going to have to leave it all. Enough for us to know this. The ultimate tragedy is that one day we're going to have to separate, not only from the joys, but also from our children and family. Right? Right? Allah says, keep that thought in mind. The pleasures of this world have to leave you. Allah says in Surah Al-Nah, Allah, He says, whatever you possess that Allah has given you has to vanish. Whatever is Allah is enduring, enduring, even if you don't know what it is. Enough for you to know that it's enduring and everlasting. Rasulullah says in a beautiful hadith in Sahih Muslim, Ba Allah, and he swear, this world in comparison with the hereafter, is nothing more than as if one of you put his finger and he gestured with his forefinger, right? He put this finger in the sea. Let him see how much water he would be able to retrieve when he pull his, pulls his finger out. So you put your finger in the sea, you pull it out. How much did you get? Nothing. Nothing. Not even a drop of water stays on your finger. At most a drop of water. He says, this is the comparison of this world to the next world. It's nothing. Absolutely nothing. All of life is in the next world, in Jannah. So Allah's advice, the divine advice, this is a beautiful verse in Surah Taha. He says to Rasulullah and all of us, because what troubles us is to continue to yearn for this life. And whenever we miss this life and miss attaining our goals in this life, we become sad. When we start to compare ourselves to what others have, it strains your heart. So Allah says, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ وَرِزْقُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرُ وَأَبْقَى What a beautiful advice. It gives you the chills. Allah says, don't extend your eyes. Don't strain your eyes. It's not fair. Because our eyes keep looking, right? They're seeking other pleasures. They're saying, I don't have as much as he or she. Allah says, don't strain your eyes. Yearning after what others have received from Allah. Other groups that Allah has given more. Don't do that. Don't strain your eyes. When you strain your eyes as you look, you're going to strain your heart. He says, I've given them the splendor of this world. That we may test them. So, so because somebody has a much bigger home, more cars, more money, more this, more that, doesn't mean they're better. Allah says, it's nothing but a test. I distribute that provision. You're tested when you don't have, and you're tested when you don't when you have. It is no indication of somebody's worth. Then Allah says, the provision, the gifts of Allah are better and more lasting. Again, beautiful advice from Allah. So watch where your eyes are going. Watch where your heart is. We cause our own grief when we keep really yearning after what others have, etc., etc., and miss out on thinking about the next world that Allah says you deserve, I deserve. The Prophet saw paradise. This is a beautiful thing. So when Rasulullah I want you to keep in mind, when Rasulullah describes Jannah, he doesn't just describe it, uh, you know, based on information conveyed to him from Jibreel. No, 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 no. Allah took him there. 
the beloved of Allah, Allahumma salli, say with me, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Again, we want to keep doing this tonight, inshaAllah. Allah took him to the highest station, brothers and sisters. The beloved of Allah was taken to a place that nobody, nobody has ever seen. What is it called? Sidratul Muntaha. So on the journey of the ascent, to honor him, Rasulullah went through so much pain. Lost his wife, lost his uncle, lost six of his children in his life. He was insulted, he was hurt, he was choked. He saw his own friends die. He carried the concern of, 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 of guiding humanity to Allah, making them see the light. It was a heavy burden. He went through a lot of pain. He never hugged his father. He never saw him. We, we don't understand the pain he went through. So Allah to honor him, to make him see where he belongs. He took him on a journey called Al-Mi'raj. First to Jerusalem and from there to ascend. And he went through the seventh heavens. And then ultimately he reached a place called Sidratul Muntaha, the low tree of the utmost boundary. There's a tree called the low tree of the utmost boundary. He and Jibreel, his companion, reached it. Jibreel looked and he stopped. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he said, Jibreel, what's happening? He said, I cannot cross that point. You're permitted to cross it and I, can, I have to stand here. I'll wait for you. If I dare to penetrate this line, I will incinerate. But you're permitted. It is at that point that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi looked back at Jibreel and he said he looked like a worn out carpet from the fear of being close to that place. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam crossed that point into the realm of Allah where no creature has ever been. Can you imagine? Rasulullah Sallallahu has been to the realm of Allah with Allah and he spoke to Allah in that realm. He was immersed in the light of Allah. Nobody has ever been there. We ask Allah to grant us a side of that place one day and the side of Sidratul Muntaha. Then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out after conversing with Allah and down the seven heavens and in that journey back he went into Jannah. So Jibreel took him into Jannah and he saw Jannah. And he saw the homes of the believers being built even by the angels. And he saw the river of Kawthar. You know with the hadith where he says, uh, we went over it a um, few sessions ago. Rasulullah described the greatest river in Jannah that is given to him. It's called Kawthar. What did he say in the hadith, if you remember? He said, I put my hand in it, right? To grab some water. That was in his visit to Jannah. And then he says, I smelled it. It was greater than any, the greatest of musts that I've ever smelled in my life. And it's purer than honey when he tasted it. And wider than milk. And the cups in the pond of that river where it pours are greater in number than the number of stars in the sky. And on it are homes that look like domes of hallowed out pearls. How did he know? He saw that. He saw that, Rasulullah Sallallahu he saw the angels, as I said, building the homes and glorifying Allah in Jannah. He felt the air of Jannah. He saw the soul of Jannah and he said the pebbles of it are made of pearls. And the, and, and the bricks that, the, in, from which the homes of Jannah are built are made of uh, gold and silver and the mortar of it is musk. How did he know? He saw that. He saw the trees that stretched for years and years and years. He saw the angels flying there, the creatures of Allah. He saw, he saw believers in Jannah. SubhanAllah, he saw all of this, we're going to describe it. So he came back from Jannah, and I always tell people, SubhanAllah, this, is, this strikes me about the beauty of Rasulullah about his heart. Not like any other heart. Think about this. If you went to an exotic place on earth, super exotic, nobody has been there, like you've been granted access, let's say to a great, great palace on earth, and you say, you can go spend time with your family there for a month. And now, one day you're going to have to leave that, you know, um, you know, leave that palace. Like, when you go back to your home and be back with your community and your family, are you going to be the same person? It's impossible. Oftentimes, when you go to high places and then we return back, we look down on the places we go back to, right? Because we say, hey, listen, I don't belong here. You don't understand where I was. I was with the king. I was with the queen. And they told me to come back. So you start wanting to be less and less with your family, with your community, with your home. You no longer like it. People who leave their villages, they go to the city, they say, ah, I don't want to go back to the village. I'm not a village person anymore. They start looking down on them. I want you to ask yourself, where did Rasulullah go? Rasulullah went beyond Sidratul Muntaha, went into Jannah, 
saw Jannat al-Firdaus. And yet, he came back to earth as a humble servant of Allah. With a smile on his face, went back eagerly to help us get to Jannah. That's not a normal heart, brothers and sisters. He never saw, you understand people where I was? I was in Jannah. I don't need this trouble. I don't need insults from you. I belong in Jannah. I was there. And, and you know what? I forced myself to come back. Right? Did he ever say this? No. He returned back as a humble creature, loving people. Never ever looking down in his home, his little tiny home. If you ever get to go to the Medina, you'll see it, how tiny it is. He, he never had much in his home. He went back to sit with his spouses, with his children, with his neighbors, with his community, loving and hugging and crying over the conditions of people. SubhanAllah, that's not normal. He wasn't saying, ah, oh, my mind is straying. It's only in Jannah now, right? Because I was there. Never. His heart was with the people to help them get to Jannah. That's something to remember about Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu He saw paradise, brothers and sisters. So when he describes it, he describes it from his experience. So what does he tell us? I share a few things here. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I've seen paradise, I've seen Jannah. And I've also seen that the inhabitants, the inhabitants of Jannah are the poorest. So these poor people who never had much on this earth, who struggled the most, and they always feel sad that they're not in the same condition as the wealthy people and so on. Guess what? The majority, majority, doesn't mean rich people are not in Jannah. But the majority of the people of the of paradise, of Jannah, are poor, from the poor. What else does he say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He says, are there, he was talking to his companions and he said, are there any of you who wants to roll up his sleeves? You know, when you roll up your sleeve for something serious, get ready, warm up. He says, who's going to roll up his sleeves to enter Jannah? Because Jannah needs work. And he describes some of it based on what he has seen. Excuse me. Oh, one second. He says, paradise, excuse me. Keep losing it. Paradise has no equal. Nothing is like it. He says, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, by Allah himself, it contains shining lights, pleasing fragrance plants, big castles, flowing rivers, ripe fruits, beautiful spouses, and many special clothes. And we'll describe all of this later, inshallah. The dwellers of paradise will have beautiful faces. They'll be immersed in endless bliss, living in high, sound, beautiful homes. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever enters it is filled with joy, will never ever feel miserable, ever. He or she will live there forever and will never die. Their clothes will never be worn out and their youth will never fade. Again, based on him seeing Jannah. In this beautiful hadith, I'm going to translate it. It is reported that about from Ibn Abbas in an authentic hadith in Bukhari that the sun was eclipsed in the time of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa performed the salah of the eclipse. There's a salah called the salah of the eclipse. When the sun is eclipsed, you go perform the salah, sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Ibn Abbas tells us he prayed such a long prayer. And, and his standing in the prayer was so long. And he read Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Then he made the rukur, and the rukur was as long as the standing. Can you imagine? This is unbelievable how much he worshipped Allah Azza wa And then when he stood up from his rukur, the standing was also very lengthy. Then he went into sujood, and the sujood was also very lengthy. And continued this salah. So I'm going to fast forward in the hadith. فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ Then Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم said إِنَّ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ آيَتَانِ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ He says, bear, bear in mind, every one of you know that the sun and the moon are two signs of the sons of Allah. They don't get eclipsed because of the death of someone or the life of someone because this, is what, this was the myth. This was the myth. The going myth in the time of uh, Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم around the Meccans was that if the sun got eclipsed, it's indicating its sadness over the death of somebody. He said, nope. These are signs of Allah Azza wa Jal to remind you of their Creator. When you see the sun eclipse or the moon being eclipsed, then mention Allah, remember Allah Azza wa Jal. Then the companions said to him, pay attention to this. This is one of the most amazing, you know, like uh, statements from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was describing this suddenly, he looked up, pay attention to this. And he extended his hand into the air. Right, he extended his hand into the air in front of the companions. Then he with, withheld, or excuse me, retreated his hand. 
So the companions looked at the Prophet they said, Oh Prophet of Allah, we just saw you. You reach with your hand, but then you couldn't grab something in the air, and there was nothing in the air, and then you brought it back. What, what was going on there? He responded by saying, I saw Jannah. So somehow Allah removed the veil, and he saw Jannah, and he saw the fruits of Jannah, and he saw a cluster of grapes in front of him in Jannah, right? So he said, I reached to grab the cluster of grapes for himself and the companions. But he said it was that I was prevented from grabbing it. But if I received, if I grabbed it, if I if I was able to catch that cluster of grapes and bring it, you could have you would have eaten it with me as long as there was life. Means that it will never be taken away from you. But it was a decree of Allah. He wanted them to see it as a promise. And for him to convey that to the to the companions to say, you know what, it's that close. Brothers and sisters, it is that close. If Allah removes the veil, you'll see it. Rasulullah Sazim was almost like able to grab it. You know where else we get this experience? In Medina. So ask Allah that He blesses us with a trip back, inshallah. After this COVID is done, maybe Allah will send all of us on this uh on this on this uh in this session attending this to visit the the, the masjid of Rasulullah. And within the masjid you see his home, and then you see a rawda. Rawda is a garden from the gardens of Jannah. So on earth, we get to experience Jannah, right? There's one place on earth. It's only like 30 feet across, something, I don't know how long, maybe 30 feet across from the house of Rasulullah SAW to the pulpit. And it's marked in the, in the message of Rasulullah SAW by a green carpet. Rasulullah SAW says, between my grave and minbari, rawda min rawda jannah, a garden from the gardens of Jannah. And people flock that space. Now you get into it, you're not going to see Jannah. You're going to feel like you're in Jannah though. And people are you know, crowding the space. You can barely fit to pray a couple of rakahs, right? And nobody wants to leave ever. But what do the scholars say? Based on this hadith, they say, if Allah removes the veil from in front of your eyes in that space, you'll see Jannah. SubhanAllah. Well, I, last time I was there, I was like sitting there next to the pulpit of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because you see the place where he used to give khutbahs. I was like just blown away. I'm like Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was here. You see the place of the tree that cried over Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see where it is. You can play in, pray in the spaces where he prayed, where he put his honorable head. SubhanAllah, where he was with his wife Aisha. You see it, all these spots, right? So I was sitting there. I said, SubhanAllah, Jannah. Allah said Jannah. And if the veil is removed, you would see Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you will see Jannah. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters. This is why it's so important to go there to replenish your faith. And now it's hard to go there, but may Allah open the door again and relieve this affliction from this earth that we're able to attain this visit back to Medina and Mecca. But if we don't, may Allah grant us paradise with Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because that's what we're here for. Inshallah, I'll... Uh, give me one second, let me just check the time. Inshallah, we'll do five more minutes and then we'll end. Purification, a condition for entering Jannah. The most important condition to enter Jannah is purification. What is purification? Jannah is the eternal abode of bliss. Perfect. There's not a blemish in Jannah. You know when you built the perfect experience on earth? Let's say you're preparing a party for your family. A special thing. Your parents have come back from overseas, blah, blah, blah. You're trying to set up a really nice banquet for them. Special people. How would it look like? Would it be perfect? Would the food be perfect? Would the experience be perfect? It has to be something that spoils it. Sooner or later, it has to end. So it's not really fully pure. Jannah is absolutely perfect and pure. So one of the conditions of Jannah, even Jannah knows this, is that everyone that enters Jannah has to be pure. They cannot have a blemish on them. That's why we have to be purified to be prepared to enter Jannah. Keep that in mind. So how do we do purification on earth? When you give me kudu, it's symbolic of that purification to stand in the realm of Allah, to pray to Him. You cannot just stand there. You got to go wash away the dirt, but it's really primarily the dirt in, in our heads, in our hearts. Because Allah is sanctified. Allah is glorious. Allah is reverent. So to be in the realm, in the space of the reverent, you have to revere your own kind of looks. You have to sanctify yourself to belong there. Jannah is the same way. You cannot belong in Jannah, enter Jannah without being purified. If we carried any impurities into the next world, if this life wasn't enough to cleanse us with our deeds, 
you know, with, with repentance, with seeking forgiveness, let's say we've done a lot of horrendous things that we still carry them into the next world, then we're going to, subhanAllah, may Allah protect us, and the person has to go visit with the hellfire a little bit to be purified, for the evil to be cleansed out, because there can be no evil in Jannah, no impurities. So they're cleansed as if they have wudu on the Day of Judgment, special wudu to prepare them to enter Jannah. SubhanAllah, even the people taken out of the hellfire, as we described last time, they're put in a river called the river of life. And it washes away all their pain. And it beautifies them. And Allah closes them with silk, and then they can enter Jannah. Jannah itself, brothers and sisters, recognizes its own beauty. And Allah says in the Quran, and I love this verse. You know, in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah begins it, بَقَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Verily, the believers are successful. This message is mentioned in the hadith, when Allah created Jannah, Allah prepared Jannah with his own hands, right? Because he wanted to take time to build the special place. And he wants us to know that he built it with his own hands. When you build something special, what do you do for someone? You take time. You put all of your imagination into it. Allah put his all his rahmas into Jannah, right? Because he wants it to be special for you and me. Because Allah loves those who serve him, those who believe in him. It's a big deal to Allah. He says, wait until I show you what I have prepared for you. So when he finished preparing Jannah, he said to Jannah, speak. So Jannah is capable of speaking, just as earth will speak on the Day of Judgment. Right? Allah says, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارًا So the Jannah can speak, just as trees can speak. Right? But we don't hear them. The first words that came out of the mouth of Jannah is what? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ All the believers are successful. You know, it's like uh, somebody very special, have special looks, and they're like, oh, look at me. They're standing in front of the mirror, they're like, look at how beautiful I am. Jannah was saying this, I'm so amazing that the ones who get me, mm, they're really going to be happy. They're the successful ones. It knows itself. Allah made it say that statement. And he's asking you and me, have you heard the voice of Jannah saying, please come? I really want you there. This is the statement of Jannah again. The first of the people to enter Jannah is the beloved of Allah, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first of all the creation. And the first nation that entered Jannah is the Ummah, the nation of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm going to save this inshallah until next time. Don't miss it. So we're going to talk about, uh, inshallah, next time, the last person to enter Jannah. Uh, what is he, you know, what is what do they look like? We're going to talk about the levels of Jannah. We're going to talk about the difference between the levels. We're going to talk about the many Jannahs and, and, and the lowest and the highest positions of Jannah. All that and the gates of Jannah and the experience of getting into Jannah. How does that look like, feel like? We're going to talk about the opening of the gates of Jannah, the description of the people of Jannah themselves. How do they look like? How do they feel like? You know, the faculties that were given. A lot, inshallah, is coming, right? Uh, we'll take our time with this again because of the special place that it is and because it is the ultimate dream and the ultimate destination. Our lives are nothing but a preparation for Jannah. Just keep that in mind. All of the good that we do, all the things that we restrain ourselves from doing, all the troubles and the trials we go through that cause you pain is preparing you for Jannah. And Jannah is special and Allah is special. And Rasulullah is special. Right? So let, let me end here. Inshallah, uh, stop the share. And uh, open the floor, inshallah, for questions, comments. So, Make sure again, um, inshallah, you come back, right? Don't don't miss, inshallah, the next sessions, um, as we continue, inshallah, this 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 beautiful journey. Keeping in mind again, salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu tonight. I actually intentionally ended a little bit, like uh, didn't even finish the hour because I want us to really continue the salawat on Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Brothers and sisters, this is it. The salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a preparation for jannah. Those closest to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah, he mentioned in one hadith, are the people of the greatest character. People of character will be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the people who make a lot of salawat on him. But out of love, out of allegiance, out of care, out of surrender. When we say sallam, means, Ya Rasulullah, I'm, I'm going to surrender completely to your commands. I'm not going to go assault your commands, assault your legacy, assault your beauty argue with you, you know, I'm here. Total respect. 
We lower our voices, brothers and sisters, when we mention Rasulullah Sallallahu Allah said it in the Quran, لا ترفعوا أصواتكم فوق صوت رسول الله. Don't raise your voices over his voice. When you go visit in Medina, when we visit his grave, we're supposed to like lower our voices and lower your head. You're passing by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when you send your greeting to him, he greets you back. This is the greatest thing we can do tonight on his birth. And alhamdulillah that we got to hear his words and think of where he is right now. So let us say again, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. I'm going to go 10 inshallah. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. 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 اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وعلى آله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ألف ألف صلاة عليك يا رسول الله ألف ألف سلام عليك يا رسول الله thousand thousand prayers upon you يا beloved of Allah thousand thousand greetings of peace and salutations upon you O beloved of Allah the number of all the jinn the number of all the humans and the number of the stars and the number of the plants and all the creatures of Allah blessings upon you O prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم so inshallah, if you have again any questions or comments, please inshallah go ahead. Any thoughts even about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Anything you want to share? This is again a special night, alhamdulillah. Uh, so inshallah. <laughs> I actually do have uh, one question. Well, not a question. I kind of wanted you to go more in depth about uh, Jannah uh, Mawa, the Garden of Abood. Could you just like go more into depth? I kind of missed that. I caught the ending of what you were saying. You said Al Ma'wa, Jannah Al Ma'wa. Did you say? Yes, the Garden of Abood on the slideshow. Right. So again, the names of the names of the garden. Right, indicate different aspects of the beauty and the bliss of the garden. Ma'wa in Arabic means refuge. Awa il al makan, he sought refuge in a place. So Allah says it's the ultimate refuge. What is a refuge? It's that which protects you from pain, from, from danger, from grief, from fear. You seek a place and you hide in it. Allah says the ultimate hiding place is Jannah, He's going to protect you from everything. Ma'wa. So like a safe space. So that's why it uses the word ma'wa to indicate the fact that it's going to shield you from anything that you don't like. All the dangers are gone. And it's a place that is like a beautiful refuge for you. You're not, you don't want to even ever leave it. That's what a refuge is, right? It's like I'm protected. I'm safe here. I'm, I'm happy here. That's indicated in the word ma'wa. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala. Jazakum Allah khair, Sheikh Tarif. Allah I have a question. Um, I don't know if you are going to touch on it at the next time or now. If you are going to talk about it, we could, you could delay the answer. And mm. and Surah Al Rahman, it talks about Jannatan mm -hmm. and it gives description. And then it says later, uh, and I wasn't sure if you are going to talk about it next yeah. time. Yeah, my delay. Good to hear from you, Akhi Abu Hassan. Allah barik fiku. Ahlak ajma'in wa duriyatak. Um, yes, so we'll talk about it, inshallah. It was actually from the material of next time. Mashallah, you hit right on it, uh, Akhi uh, Muhammad Abu Hassan. So, Surah Al Rahman is an elaborate description of Jannah. I mean, we, by the way, we can spend sessions and sessions and sessions talking about Jannah. It's like such an elaborate description in Quran. Why is there so much description? Because it's your place. It's your home. Allah doesn't just say heaven. By the way, go to any other religion. You're not going to see the vivid description of the next world. Let alone even the notion of a next world. Allah is so vivid and detailed. Surah Al-Rahman talks about what's waiting for the believer. Allah says, For the muqarrabun, akhi. Al-muqarrabun are the closest to Allah. Right? Have two special gardens. And then Allah describes them, right? Their bliss is unique. Then He says, وَمِن دُونِهِمَا And underneath them are two gardens. 
For who? Ashabul Yameen. Right? So they're lower, however, I want to clarify that the people who are in lower places in Jannah don't think they have less. They're actually like pff, kicking it. They're like, ah, nobody is like me. Even the lowest person you see in the next time we're going to describe, we're going to show you the lowest person in Jannah. And the lowest person in Jannah thinks he's the greatest person in Jannah. How does that work? Because Allah will never make anybody miserable. You're not going to be in Jannah thinking, oh, I can't believe I didn't have that higher house or chamber or garden. Nope, never. Your heart will never experience misery or sadness. Never. Guaranteed by Allah. No matter where you are, you're so happy. You don't even exchange it for anything else. You're going to be like, nobody's as good as me. I'm the, I achieved the highest achievement of all the people in paradise and the whole existence by where I am right now. That's how overwhelming it is. So those two jannas are for the second grade believers. Right? And then Allah describes it in Surah Al-Rahman. But Rasulullah says, when you ask, ask for, don't ask for the lowest. It's like asking for, my old, my son always tells me, like, you know, we always talk about the, just, you know, shooting for the A and then getting the B versus shooting for the C and then getting a D, right? Then you flunk. You got to aim for the A and if you get a B, that's fine, right? Rasulullah says, when you ask, ask for Firdaus. Don't ask for anything of us. The highest and the best realm, best garden in Jannah is Firdaus. That's what Rasul, what Rasulullah will be anyway. So we want to be with him. It's unimaginable not to be with him. And he said, وسلم, those who loved, you're going to be with the ones that you love. We're going to talk about also how you're going to be gathered with your family. There's a lot, by the way, we just started, right? You have no idea, like when we go into the description of Jannah, how incredible it is. Right? We're going to dig deep into very... Thank you. Abu Hassan, Habibi. But I hope, inshallah, that answers the question. And also, I want to say, Sister Amira, I know you asked the question, and I just looked at the name, um, Amirat uh, Ailola. Um, you know, Amirat is a daughter of our dear brother Abdullah, who passed away uh, last spring. He's a beloved member of our community. Uh, wallahi, uh, Sister Amirat, I was thinking of your dad when I prepared this. I am not kidding. Uh, he's one of the closest people to my heart in this journey of life, one of my closest brothers and friends. I love him dearly. I know his family adores him. I know also I've seen the the name of his wife, uh, Sister Rashid, is also with us. You know, subhanAllah, they join us in this uh, in this episode. They've lost somebody who's very dear to them. And I know others who are in, in attendance have lost dear members of their family as well. I ask Allah that he joins you with them. But I wanted to really take a, you know, just sit back and picture them in this bliss. In this bliss, don't don't doubt it. Inshallah, they're with Allah. Allah removed all their grief, all their pain. They're waiting for you. And the time they wait is not as long as the time you wait. Because their perception of time is shorter, right? It's us who think it's a long journey. Don't worry. You're going to be with them, inshallah. Allah, where do I, how do I guarantee this? No, I'm not guaranteeing. Allah is the one who's guaranteeing it. He says in the Quran, the believers will be joined with their families. It's as simple as that. Because Allah is so generous. They will never want to come back. Allah, when I think of my dear brother Abdullah, I can I seem like he doesn't want to come back. He's with Allah. He reached his his station with Allah. He, this abode of peace. They're with Allah where they belong. So they just want us to get get good to them, inshallah. On that note, also I want to um, share the you know Subhanallah like um, the sad news of uh, you know our dear brother Roman. His his um, father also passed away. Uh, just a couple of days ago and uh, you know it's very difficult clearly on him he's very close to his dad and he's now in India they just buried him uh, yesterday um, subhanallah it's very hard hard moment for him to lose his dad uh, we ask Allah to have mercy on his dad on our dear brother Abdullah on everybody that has passed away from our community from these dear families that are in attendance with us uh, we ask Allah to join them with their loved ones with their families and to join with Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and ask Allah to wash away all of your grief, all of your pain, and to fill your hearts with this glad tiding and the image of your loved ones smiling and being next to Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa If you have that in your heart, the sadness will be diminished, inshallah. They're alive, eating and drinking. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Allah will not turn down our du'as. Allah is beautiful, guarantees it. Allah answers all the du'as. 
but Allah wants us to yearn for Him. We're all on a journey back. Just remember this. The days are counted. The, the breaths are counted. We're all headed back. So they're waiting for us. So just keep that in mind. Don't hang on to this earth, right? Do your best. Plant your seeds. We're going. We're leaving. We ask Allah to join all of us in Jannah for those. So i um, just going to go to the chat and see if there's any... Um, Okay, yes, yes, inshallah. I see a request here. Uh, a question about the concept of Jannah on earth and the story of Adam. Okay, so there's a question on the concept of Jannah on earth in the story of Adam alayhi salam. So there's a difference of opinion. So in Surah Al Baqarah, it's described uh, in also Surah um, Al A'raf. So Allah talks about the experience of Adam alayhi salam how Allah admitted him and Hawa, his wife, into Jannah. Then in Jannah, they were giving everything, every bliss, and you know all their needs were fulfilled. Then Allah took them out of Jannah when they violated that one command of Allah and they ate from the tree, right? Uh, minha, descend from it, descend from it, right? So this it, this Jannah, what is, what is this Jannah? Is it the Jannah? that we are talking about, or is it a, a Jannah on earth? The scholars differed. Again, the scholars differed. They, they could not come definitively, you know, come up with a definitive answer. Some group of scholars said it's actually a Jannah on earth. What evidence did they use to, to corroborate that conclusion? Is that the, the Jannah of the next world is not a Jannah that anybody can ever be taken out of. And because the shaitan whispered, to them in Jannah. So they said that's evidence that it's not the, the, the grand Jannah. Others say no. Allah permitted that whisper because he wanted to test them. And, it, and you know, it doesn't mean, you know, that was an exception again that he took them out of it. So it's actually the real Jannah. And why would he put him, why would he not put him in that Jannah? Ultimately, he created us to be in Jannah. So both have different conclusions. Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best. So that's, that's again, uh, the answer to this. Uh, it could be a Jannah on earth. It might be the, the Jannah. One day we're going to go back and ask Allah, right? He'll tell us, inshallah, once we go back to Allah. And it's not far. You know, one day we're going to catch our last breaths and be out of this world. And you're going to see everything we've been talking about. And feel it and hear it. And subhanAllah. So inshallah, we'll get the answers soon. Um... Just see, trying to see if there's any other questions. Okay. Okay. I got the request for the dua. Inshallah, I'll make it shortly. Any other comments, questions? Um, so, uh, you know, and again, I'll remind everybody about a dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every morning and every evening. If you remember the session from uh, about the hellfire, what did he say? Can, can, can anybody remember the dua? So, Allahumma ajirni min al-nar. Allahumma ajirni min al-nar. So, Rasulullah said in the morning, he would say, Ya Allah, protect me from the hellfire. Ya Allah, protect me from the hellfire seven times. And at night, he'll say, Ya Allah, admit me into Jannah. Protect me from the hellfire. Admit me into Jannah. Protect me from the hellfire seven times. So, you need to ask for Jannah. If you care for something, you ask for it. If we don't ask for it, that means it's not on our minds. That's why, brothers and sisters, the Qur'an is full of details about Jannah. So that you think about it. You dream about it. You ask for it. It becomes your dream, your goal, right? It's not just an empty concept. So make sure you and your family, teacher, self, spouse, children, to ask Allah daily to protect you from the hellfire, saying, oh Allah, shield me, my children, my family from the hellfire. Seven times in the morning, seven times at night, and at night, at least at night, say as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ya Allah, admit me into Jannah al -Firdaus. Ya Allah, admit me into Jannah al -Firdaus. Say it seven times, minimum. So that's another action item for all of us. Anything, inshallah, else? We're here. If you have any questions. So what time next week? Um, same time. We're sticking to this time, inshallah. 7.30, uh, we'll, inshallah, do the sessions. They're fixed. They're, you know, um, so expect it, expect it to be the same time, inshallah. 
And have a, again, to whet your appetite, I have a lot of material, inshallah, coming to you. So don't miss it. I really mean it. I'm not just saying that. When I say don't miss it, don't miss it. Because I, I, alhamdulillah, I spent years going through this material, brothers and sisters. Years learning. Years uh, documenting. Years making my own comments. I have tons and tons and tons of materials like that I've, you know, that I've studied over the years that I'm consolidated all of it, summarize it into the, this presentation for you. I really mean it. So it's from Allah, not from myself. It's taken out of the Quran, the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu uh, And it's just mesmerizing, mesmerizing material. So inshallah, don't miss it. If you don't have any questions, I don't want to keep you here. Kids, you don't have any questions? Malik, Idris, you don't have any questions? Typical hey, side. Heaven. What is it? I mean. Ameen. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Ask Allah to join all of us there, inshallah. So, so you know, brothers and sisters, again, just a reminder, right? We're going through tough times. Uh, people are experiencing severe illnesses because of COVID and other illnesses, but these are extremely difficult times. I mean, this pandemic, it's like a form of a plague, so to speak, has really afflicted this earth. It's a test from Allah, but it really has shattered families. And, and it's taken souls away abruptly. And those who are struggling with this, those who are ill with this, are, you know, they're going through tough times, right? It, you know, the illness hits, you know, subhanAllah, you've heard, you've heard. we don't want to go over, um, you know, kind of keep dwelling on what it does. We know it very well, but it's really a time to ask for Allah to relieve those who are afflicted with it and to relieve the families who are struggling with this illness. So I'm going to ask, inshallah, dua. Unless you have any questions, I'm going to conclude, inshallah, with this dua. And then with also salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Idris, you can ask the question. Do you want to ask it? Yes, you can. Before oh. I make the dua. Go ahead. So like, like, is there like a guarantee how you know you're going to go to heaven? Like like something Allah gives you a mm -hmm. sign like, oh my God, bro, you're going to go to heaven right away. Like you're chilling. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so there are many signs that you know that Allah is happy with you. First of all, you're going to feel it in your heart, right? If you think about Allah a lot, you love Allah, that's actually in itself is a sign. If you find yourself doing good deeds, right, that's a sign. Like you find yourself giving charity. You find yourself, oh, wanting to make salah on time. You find yourself mentioning Allah. You find yourself wanting to learn about Rasulullah You find yourself doing that. Thinking about them, that's a sign from Allah that He's happy with you. Inshallah, He wants to enter in Jannah. But Allah tells us, don't be carried away. Meaning, just because somebody feels good and Allah is helping them, you know, giving them this feeling in their heart and making them do good deeds because it's a gift from Allah to do good deeds, right? He doesn't want us to become arrogant. Imagine if people were guaranteed Jannah, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to chill right now. I'm not going to do anything. So Allah doesn't want us to rest. Because if we're guaranteed for sure, for sure, for sure, maybe we'll stop praying. Maybe we'll stop being charitable. Maybe we'll stop and we say, hey, I'm better than everybody else. I don't need this earth. Allah says, nope, I'm not going to let you have that, right, guarantee. But he wants us to really feel good about it and to dream about it and say, he says, don't worry, but keep working and don't ever stop working because maybe in the last moments of our lives, th things will change and then we might lose our faith. Does that make sense, Idris? So the fact that you're worshiping Allah is a sign. And you have a feeling, good feeling in your heart that Allah is happy with you. But Allah says, to be happy with you, keep working. Keep, you know, worshipping Allah, remembering Him, showing good character, taking care of your parents, right? Does that make sense, Idris? Yes, it does. Ewala. Ewala. So there, in the time of Rasulullah there's 10 companions who are guaranteed. Their names, Allah gave Rasulullah a list of names of people who are guaranteed Jannah. These are the best best of the companions. They actually knew, right? But they kept working, working very hard uh, until the last moment in their lives. SubhanAllah, they were so humble, right? That's why they're very special people. So uh, just... Imam Tarif, uh, go ahead, Afi. Go ahead, Brother Rasul. Um, Imam Tarif, this is Moshin here. Yes. Um, you mentioned the Salawat, and I want to very quickly share a Salawat story Please. with the community. Uh, you referred to the fact that we went for Umrah together. Mm. Uh, ICCP, 50 of us. Right. Uh, we checked in at the airport. 
and everybody boarded the plane. And at the very end, just when the final call came in, uh, my wife, Siti, found that she had, she couldn't find a passport. Oh. And everybody was panicking, as you will remember. And uh, you were, you and, I, and a few others were frantically looking for this because the plane was about to take off. And some of us had to um, perhaps stay back because I didn't want to leave her behind. And then you went in and you were reciting Salawat, uh, whispering Salawat. And then... Out of nowhere, you saw her handbag and opened her hand. In that wallet, you found the part. And with that, within two minutes, we want uh, that uh, even the art and worry with everybody so that when you're in a deep crisis, just don't panic. Recite Salawat and a solution will come. Oh, well. Hello, brother. Yeah, of course. I I, can, how can I forget, brother? Master? We had incredible memories together. Brother Mustin is talking about something. I swear, Brother Mustin, I'm going to tell you some, say something. I know you're like, you don't like to hear it. He was the calmest soul there, him and his wife, Siti. They were so calm. We were frantic and they were calm. I don't know how you, how calm they were. I was blown away. May Allah bless both of you. But indeed, brothers and sisters, the, the, the plane was about to take off. We couldn't believe it. Like, no, not the passport, right? And so, Allah, I remember, yeah, we made salawat on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And... And Rasulullah said, Allah will relieve you. Allah will fulfill your needs. And it happened. We found it right right away. And we raced into the plane and it took off. They were about to close the door. I said, miracle. The way we started the journey to visit Rasulullah was on that note. And hours later, we're in Mecca. You know, excuse me, we're in Medina. It was incredible to visit Rasulullah And there's nothing like sending salawat. So do as Brother Mustin advised. No, don't just say it in response to the mention of the name of Rasulullah No, no, no. Make it active remembrance. And when you need something, you lose something, make salawat on Rasulullah When you're not feeling well, make salawat on Rasulullah Things are hard. Salawat on Rasulullah as much as you can. And wallahi, I say to families, if you are concerned about the faith of your children, make them love Rasulullah and make salawat on him. Wallahi, it's, it's, it, it will nourish their hearts with faith. This is one of the most guaranteed ways to elevate faith in the heart. Jazakallah khair, Brother Mahsin. We ask Allah to bring us back as ICCP on another trip, inshallah, with 50 new people, maybe the 50 who, who signed up today. <laughs> say I mean, everybody say I mean right now. Say I mean. So inshallah, Allah will join us together. Uh, uh, those who want to sign up can send me the message and we'll put them on the list. You know what? We'll take you off on it. I love this because we don't know when it will happen, but you've yeah. already signed up with Allah, right? You're like, Yeah, Allah, here's my name. If this opens, I'm going, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 how. Do not say how or what. Just but, send but, me. But, but, <laughs> but don't but don't just sign up. Send send a deposit as well. Here you go. <laughs> Brilliant, brother Mahsen. And, and, and make salawat of Rasulullah and just send the money, right? <laughs> I, I, I could not have outdone you in this uh, fundraising pitch, mashallah. So, alhamdulillah. So, inshallah, Allah, I'm looking forward. I really mean it when I say I'm personally looking forward to it. I can't wait. I was thinking the other day, so well, I miss so much of life, going back to normal. But I said, I just miss being in the masjid of Rasulullah. I'm telling you the truth. There's nothing like it. <laughs> just nothing like it. I, I hope that we can go together, inshallah, one day. And we're sending the request to Allah. Allah will make anything possible. Ya Allah, join us together in the masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and send us an umrah, Ya Allah, together as brothers and sisters with ICCP. Inshallah, Ya Allah, as soon as possible, you're the one who makes the impossible possible. I mean, I mean, and with that, inshallah, I'm just going to say, look, one final look at the... Um, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Safa. How are you? Good. So I have a question. Sure. So let's say, like, in the day of judgment, and, like, when when you're in Jannah, 
like, will you see the Prophet ﷺ before you enter Jannah or in Jannah? Very good question, Safa. You know, um, always good to hear your voice. So, Rasulullah ﷺ, you get to see him before Jannah. Allah, no. Allah, you get to see him in Jannah, right? But Rasulullah ﷺ, you get to see him. And where's the first place you're going to see, really see Rasulullah ﷺ? It, at least meet him. We're guaranteed that is at the at his pulpit, right next to the pond. There's this little pond, not little, big pond. It's called the pond of Kawthar, where he Rasulullah was grab a cup and give it to you to 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 uh, uh, for you to drink from, right, with his honorable hand, and he'll greet you. If that's the first time you see him, or you meet him, you talk to him. And then Rasulullah will be waiting for us at the doors of Jannah. And none of us can enter the door of Jannah without Rasulullah. So we'll be waiting for him and the gates of Jannah are closed. We're going to talk about this next time. Safa. And then Rasulullah will come to us and he'll knock on the door of Jannah. And then the angels will open the gate only for him. The doors, all eight gates of Jannah open and we enter Jannah with Rasulullah. So we get to see him before. And we go in with him, with our families. Amin, amin. That's Allah to make us among those who are with him as we enter Jannah. Does that make sense, Safa? Is that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I'm making dua for you, Safa. That inshallah you'll be with us. Yeah, thanks. Thank okay. you. Okay, any other questions, inshallah, or should we wrap? Okay, let's wrap, inshallah. Um... Oh Allah, you are the most gracious, you are the most merciful, you're the compassionate one, you're the source of life. Ya Allah, from you we come, to you we return. Ya Allah, you are the one who created the heavens and the earth for us to know, Ya Allah, to remember you and to worship you. Mm-hmm. We beseech you and ask you, Allah, on this blessed night of the birth of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you send your peace and prayers and blessings upon him and upon his family, Ya Allah. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Ya Allah, you are the one who blessed us with Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the best gift, as the most exalted blessing from you, Ya Allah. Through him, we came to know about you, Ya Allah. Through him, we came to understand what virtue is, what beauty is, what nur is, Ya Allah. Through him, we were taken out of darkness into the light, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, through him, we... We, we attain those special stations with you, Ya Allah. With Him, we understand how to become better human beings, Ya Allah. How to become better fathers and mothers and children and parents, Ya Allah. With Him, we understand what beauty and faith is, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, He suffered so much. He struggled so much. We ask you that we reward Him, Ya Allah, with wasila and fadila. You grant Him the highest station in the heavens, Ya Allah. It only belongs to Him when we beseech you to grant it to Him, Ya Allah. Grant it to Him, Ya Allah. We beseech you, Ya Allah, and, and, and beg you, Ya Allah, that you reward him from, for all the pain, all the suffering, all the endurance, all the efforts, and all the struggles that he has exerted in his journey, Ya Allah, and into the hereafter. We ask Allah that you grant him the greatest intercession, the greatest intercession, a shafa'atul udma, Ya Allah, that you make us among those who receive that shafa'a, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, enfold us, Ya Allah, under your care, and put us under your care and shade, Ya Allah, with Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with his children and spouses, Ya Allah, and entire family, join us with him, Ya Allah. Grant us from his honorable hand a drink after which we'll never ever be thirsty, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, grant us Jannah al-Firdaus with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, do not make us among those who don't live in Jannah with Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we don't want anything else but to be with Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, make us emulate him, Ya Allah. Strengthen our allegiance to him, Ya Allah. Make us, Ya Allah, among the humble followers of Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Attach us to him, Ya Allah. Make us among those who send salawat upon him day and night that we never ever forget who he is, what he was, what he'll always be, the greatest gift from you, Allah. Ya Allah, make us live in his light, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, in his nur, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us among the followers of Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those who love him, Ya Allah. Make us among your worshippers, Ya Allah. Grant us, Ya Allah, nearness to you, Ya Allah. Grant us your love, Ya Allah, and the love of Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask, Ya Allah, 
that you relieve all those families who are afflicted with illness, Ya Allah, on this earth. We ask, Ya Allah, that you relieve all those families who are afflicted with COVID, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you that you enfold all of those who lost loved ones with care, with your mercy, Ya Allah. Relieve them, Ya Allah. Relieve them of their affliction. Ya Allah, remove from them their pain, their grief, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, join them with their loved ones, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, have mercy on their loved ones, Ya Allah. We beseech, Ya Allah, that you have mercy on the father of our dear brother, Roman, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, enfold them in your care. Ya Allah, fill his grave with light, Ya Allah. Grant him Jannah to Firdaus, Ya Allah. Join him with his son, Ya Allah, and all of his family, Ya Allah. Our dear brother Abdullah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Grant him Jannah to Firdaus. Join him with his family, Ya Allah, and every single one, Ya Allah, who departed from this earth that we know of, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, elevate them in Jannah. Join them with Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alleviate their families, Ya Allah. Remove from their families their suffering, Ya Allah. Remove from them, Ya Allah, all of their grief, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask Ya Allah that you accept your, our prayers. Accept our salawat upon Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Guide our children. Bless our children, Ya Allah. Bless our parents. Bless ICCP. Bless our community. Wa salli Allahumma ala Sayyidina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين بارك الله فيكم I love you for the sake of Allah Valentina السلام عليكم I wanted to say السلام عليكم to you Valentina I see your face <laughs> so بارك الله بدكتور مير دكتور مير you're there I know دكتور uh, also Dean السلام عليكم I see your face good to see everyone brother Shahid may Allah bless you good to see you all of you are my duas take care of yourselves inshallah and inshallah أسعدك عبد الإله and Brother Mahsin, I also see your face and everybody else. Love you for the sake of Allah. Keep making yeah, salat on Rasulullah Don't forget that through tomorrow and after, right? But bring this day to life, inshallah, with your families. Inshallah.